uh, a beautiful lady, uh, Leslie Downer, who is also very <laughs> famous for her books, uh, such as uh, Geisha or um, the Madame Sadayako. Um, she came here with her new uh, book here. Uh, and um, I, I talked with her, and then I said, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about her because she's going to do that. You are here not to listen to me. So basically, I'm handing it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Shukuko, Shihoko, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, can you all hear me? Are you all happy? Um, I'm very pleased to see so many people here tonight, uh, particularly as there's a rail strike, but you made it all the same. Um, so, my story begins with the most dramatic and momentous event in the whole of Japanese history. Um, on Friday, July the 8th, 1853, um, the third day of the sixth month of the year of the ox, Kaye 6, four monstrous ships appeared. Um, there were fishermen out in their boats at the mouth of Edo Bay, with the great city of Edo at the far end of the bay, Edo, which was later to become known as <coughs> Tokyo. And these fishermen reported that these ships that they saw loomed as large as mountains. In other words, they were a lot, a lot bigger than it was humanly possible for a ship to be. If you saw the film Independence Day, they were like those spaceships hovering over every city. Just basically too big. Ships, ships couldn't be that big. And they were travelling as swiftly as birds. In other words, going faster than it was humanly possible for a ship to go. And they had smoke pouring out of them. Well, it was, it was indeed an alien invasion. But it wasn't Martians, it was Americans. Um, it was Commodore Perry and his four black ships, and the whole country went into panic. So, my new novel, The Shogun's Queen, is the true story of one young girl whose life was completely transformed by the arrival of these monstrous vessels. My heroine's name was Okatsu, and she grew up in the little town of Ibuski, way down at the bottom of Kyushu, um, some of you may have been there. You can be buried up to your neck in the hot black sands. Very good for you. Um, it's a little resort. It's a little bit like Margate. And her father... <laughs> it's a resort. And her father was the Lord of Ibuski, which is kind of like being the Lord of Margate. So he was not the most powerful of people. But the prince of her province and her uncle was Shimazu Nariakira, who was the most wealthy the most powerful and absolutely definitely the most brilliant of the warlords, of the daimyos in Japan at that time. Um, he was also very enlightened. He knew exactly what the black ships were and what a threat they were. And he had a brilliant idea of how to fight back. And his idea was to marry his daughter to the shogun, the, the, the lord of the realm, so that that would give him control of the reins of power. Well, he didn't actually have a daughter, but um, that didn't stop him. He adopted Okatsu. He made her his daughter and he changed her name to Princess Atsu. And a month later she was in a palanquin on her way across Japan to marry the Shogun. This is actually her palanquin. It's in the Smithsonian in Washington. It was discovered not that long ago. And the whole journey was 900 miles. It took a month and a half. Um, so, well, she was a princess, so she didn't go by herself. She went in a mammoth procession, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, rather like the Queen. The Queen wouldn't set off by herself to go to Marks and Spencer or something. Um, so like the Queen at Trooping the Colour, she was accompanied by a vast procession, which took altogether four or five days to pass through any one village along the way. And finally, they circled Edo Bay. Um, and there's the procession. Um, and over there, in the distance, is where she actually would have seen the black ships on their second visit, um, threateningly close to the capital, to Edo. And finally, she arrived in the great city of Edo. Now, this was a really, really beautiful city. Westerners that went there called it the Venice of the East. 
It was full of canals, full of streams, full of little boats shuttling up and down, um, with the castle moat, like a snail shell, curling round and round. And right at the centre was the castle. And in the background, in those days, you could see Mount Fuji. And as I'm sure you know, Edo came to be known as Tokyo, not that long after. And she was carried in a grand procession to the castle, right at the heart of Edo. Is that castle still here? That castle? Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> uh, it's not that castle. Not that castle. We'll come to that. Um, <laughs> so she was carried across the moat. Actually, okay, I can answer that. No, I won't. I'll answer that later. We'll see. Um, she was carried past the house of a hundred guards and the moat of swans, and she was carried up tide viewing slope, which is still there. This is tide viewing slope, this is the moat of swans. And you can see from the bulwark, you can see the size of the bulwarks of the castle, and you can see the scale from this little person who's standing there. It was a mammoth, mammoth edifice. And she went through the great gate, which led to the women's palace, and she heard the gate bang shut behind her, and she knew she would never come out again. Once you were in, that was it. Um, it was like the Roach Motel. You check in and you don't check out. And it was only when she was inside that she finally stepped out of her palanquin. So Edo Castle <coughs> was Japan's Versailles. It was a place of fabulous riches, of unimaginable wealth and luxury and beauty. It was like Xanadu. It was like Kublai Khan's Xanadu. And it was absolutely enormous. If you think of Buckingham Palace, and 10 Downing Street, and the Houses of Parliament, and Whitehall, all rolled into one. It combined those functions, and it was about that big. It was a mile across and four miles in circumference. And there were beautifully landscaped pleasure gardens. There were streams, there were lakes, there were hills, there were moon-viewing pavilions, there were tea ceremony huts. And this sort of answers your question. This is not Edo Castle. It burnt down before any photographs could be taken. So what I'm doing is trying to conjure it up for you by showing you pictures of places which do still exist, but they're all much, much smaller. So all these places, imagine it, you know, a, a hundred times larger and grander and more splendid, and that was Edo Castle. So a very few Western visitors actually went inside the castle, and they wrote about the incredible lavishness of it. One was the Dutch Dr. Engelbert Kampfer, and he was there in 1691. And another was Townsend Harris, the first American consul. In fact, that was about it, those two. Um, and he went in 1858. And they wrote about the lavish gold leaf covered screens that formed the walls and doors. <coughs> about the beautiful paintings on the screens. And about the coffered ceilings, which were 30 foot high. And the beautiful alcoves glimmering with gold, with, ha with hanging scrolls. Well, one thing about these Western visitors was they were all men, so they certainly weren't going to see any women. And also, they were Westerners, they were outsiders, so they didn't get beyond, really, the absolute outside rim of the most public part of the castle. Let's take a quick sip of water here. Um, actually, Keimfer, in 1691, did spot the silhouettes of ladies hidden behind screens to watch the amazing sight of the Dutchman dancing. Um, but other than that, they didn't catch a glimpse of any ladies. <coughs> <coughs> because, as in China, I'll just lower my voice a bit, okay? Um, so tell me if it's too low. But as in China, the vast forbidden city in Peking, as in the top Kapi harem of the Ottoman sultans, the ladies lived in seclusion. Well, there were actually not one, but three massive palace complexes within um, Edo Castle. There was the Honman, the main palace complex. There was the Ninomaru, the second palace complex. There was the Nishinomaru, the western palace complex, which is not marked here. Um, and this is, let's look at the main palace complex here, the Honmaru. Um, this is the Omote. This is the front palace. It's the outer palace. And those Western visitors wouldn't have got beyond the Ohiroma, the grand audience chamber, um, where they would have been received by the shogun. 
Then you had the Nakaoku, which is the middle palace, which was the shogun's home. He practiced martial arts, he studied, he saw his government ministers there. And then you had right here, across the whole extent of the palace, a wall, rather like the wall that President-elect Trump wants to build between America and Mexico. It was a solid wall, and there was only one door in it, and the door was just there, and only one man ever went through that door, and that one man was the shogun. And on the other side of the wall was the Ōoku, it was the great interior. And I should just point out that the buildings, it wasn't, they're not an um, enormous monolithic building like Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle. There's lots of little low buildings linked up with walkways with gardens between. So it was a different sort of way of making a palace from a Western palace. So what did the shogun see as he stepped through that one door and entered the inner palace, the great interior? Well, the great interior is a great mystery. The women who lived there were sworn to secrecy. They had to take an oath of silence, that they wouldn't speak or write or record anything they heard, witnessed or experienced inside the palace. And even when the castle was handed over to the enemy and the women were thrown out onto the streets, they didn't give anything away. One or two of them did when they were very old, but otherwise they didn't. And the only time that you might see one of the palace ladies was when they were getting out of their palanquins to go to the temple, to pray for the shogun's ancestors, um, or to go to the theatre, which they did do from time to time. And for you, that would be like seeing the Queen or Princess Kate. I mean, they were huge celebrities. And it's so surrounded by mystery that we don't even know for sure how many women lived there, though it's said it was 3,000. Well, the palace burnt down regularly, including not long after Adsa got there, my heroine. But one building was preserved. And I told you that they were small buildings side by side. So this one little building doesn't look particularly prepossessing, but it was one of the many buildings that made up the women's palace. Um, and one thing you can see in there is the gold leaf covered walls, the staggered shelves, and the sort of subtle paintings they had on the screens. It was much, much more delicate, subtle paintings in the women's palace than it was in the men's. And you can see the coffered ceiling there. There are also sketches by the artist Kano Osanobu for uh, wall paintings for the Women's Palace after it burnt down, one of the many times it burnt down. Um, the shogun at the, at the time was Ienari. He was the 11th shogun. Um, and he, he didn't like the Mandarin ducks. He said they were boisterous. Um, well, also, Mandarin ducks symbolize wedded bliss. So maybe he thought it wasn't quite right for his harem. Um, so Kano prepared an alternative design on a little piece of paper, which he unrolled, and so there was, he, there was a pheasant instead. Um, the rest of it's the same. And Ian I really liked that, so that was how it, that was, how it was uh, painted. So there's only one photograph of these ladies. This is it. Um, you can see the, her hairpin. You can see that her eyebrows are shaved and painted in on her forehead. And you can see the thick quilted hem of her beautiful robe. Um, but although there's only one photograph, there recently there have been a whole lot of very popular TV series about the Women's Palace in Japan. Um, and there's, there's lots and lots of stills from these TV series. In fact, I have several of them on DVD. They're great. Um, and the hairstyle from, I think, from paintings is pretty accurate. Um, the robes, I'm sure they've researched them very carefully, also pretty accurate. Um, I'm afraid that the makeup is, it's modern makeup. They didn't look like that. This is for Western, for Western taste, for modern taste. This is for modern taste. Um, so they look very pretty, but they probably, the real women of the Women's Palace probably didn't look like these ladies. For a start, they had their eyebrows shaved and painted in on their forehead. Um, there were two styles of dress. One was the imperial style of dress wearing these multi-layered robes, like in the Heian period, actually. Um, and here's a lady, actually, rather modern in her makeup, but wearing these. You can see how enormously bulky and uncomfortable they would be to wear. Um, and also, besides having shaved eyebrows, they would have had blackened teeth. Um, so these prints 
Also, very interesting, um, but don't forget the artists were men, so by definition they probably wouldn't have seen these women. Um, and also, the prints were mainly done at the end of the 19th century when the women's palace no longer existed. So in other words, it's imagination. Uh, probably more accurate in the hairstyles and the makeup than modern representations. Um, anyway, here's two very nice pictures from Chikonobu's album of the Women's Palace, which is in the V&A, actually. Gorgeous. So let's step inside the palace walls. Here's the wall I told you about, dividing the middle palace from the, from the inner, the great interior, the Women's Palace. Um, and here is a plan of the Women's Palace. Here's the wall. Here's the middle palace. That's the door. Um, these are gardens. And just take a quick look at that, because you can see from that the unbelievable number of little rooms, thousands of little rooms. These here are the apartments of the ladies-in-waiting, and so are these. These ones go way off the page. It's like another page of apartments of the ladies-in-waiting. And um, here it is in English, much simplified. But here is the door that the shogun came through, into the upper bell corridor. That's, as I said, that's the middle interior. Um, this is, it was called the shogun's little sitting room. It was very far from little, but that was what it was called. And he usually went about as far as there. Um, and then there was my heroine, Atsa's wing. It was the shogun's consort's wing. And you can see it's kind of a bit off to one side. It's kind of out of the main stream of things. And then there's Lady Honjuin was the shogun's mother. So that's the shogun's mother's wing, right in the middle of everything where she could keep good control. Um, then there's the great hall, the kitchens, the shrine room, the baths. Here are the apartments. Here's more apartments. Um, inside this dotted line was where men could come. Um, and in fact, government, government officials could come to the visitors' audience chambers and could have meetings with the shogun's mother and the shogun's wife. Um, and other men came in too. For example, the doctor came most days and checked up the most important ladies. Um, and also, there were a whole lot of working people. There were carpenters, there were builders, there were gardeners, um, and they were mainly men. Um, but one thing was, if you were a great lady, you didn't, you didn't even see these men. They just didn't, they didn't exist. They, they were just around. Um, and that was actually quite helpful. If you, had, if you were a lady and you had a secret mission to accomplish, you might be able to deal with a gardener because the other ladies wouldn't even see him. So you might be able to pass a message, probably not directly, but from you to a maid to a maid, into the hands of a gardener who could then get it out of the palace. Um, and there was somebody that Atsa's uncle sent to help her out. He, was, he became rather famous. His name was Saigo Takamori. Um, and he was actually a gardener in the women's palace. And he was helping her out. So he played quite a large part. Now, the person that established the palace and its rules was a lady called Kasuga no Tsubone. She lived from 1579 to 1643. And she was the wet nurse of the third shogun. Well, he kind of, he took to his wet nurse and throughout his entire life, he confided in, he consulted her. She was incredibly powerful. She ran the women's palace. And she made it into a separate institution and she drew up the rules, which were things like absolute loyalty to the shogun's family, observance of all rules and regulations, maintaining decorum, keeping everything secret. And everything, right down to the smallest hair ribbon was determined by regulation and by precedence. Everything was laid out. So you have the theory and you have the practice. In theory, right at the top of the hierarchy, the most important person was the shogun's consort, the shogun's wife. Um, well, she was, she was called the Midai de Kolo. She was called the, the Midai, and that was what um, my heroine Atsu became. And the Midai, the shogun's consort, was invariably a Kyoto lady of noble family, chosen when she was just a child to be married to the shogun. So nobody had any say in the matter at all, um, in order to bind the shogun's court to the emperor's court in Kyoto. 
So in order to marry the shogun, my heroine Atsa had to be made into an imperial princess. Well, Atsa was a bit like Princess Diana, because she wasn't born to be a princess. She had actually experienced freedom. And the princesses who grew up in Kyoto, had, they, they were born in the palace, they grew up in the palace, they never left the palace, they stepped into a palanquin, and they ended up in another palace, and they never saw the big wide world. But Atsa did. So it must have been pretty hard for her to be suddenly locked inside the palace. Basically, the higher you were in rank, the more hidden you were, and the less free you were. So if you were the emperor or the shogun, probably you never went outside your palace. You were born there, you died there, that was it. Um, so the shogun's wife brought with her her own staff. She lived in her own wing. Um, and in theory, she was very powerful. And she ran the orku. In theory, she was the boss. In practice, she was more like the president. Um, she didn't, she, you had to pay her a lot of respect, but she didn't actually wield much power. Um, for one thing, the Kyoto aristocrats were inbred, and they were not very strong. So when the wife had children, they normally died. And nearly all the shoguns were not the children of their father's wife. They were mainly the children of one of the father's concubines. And also she was an outsider. She'd come from Kyoto. Um, and whereas there were other people, like the shogun's mum, who'd been in the palace all along, and they could build up their power base. So there were many different ranks of staff. Right up to the top, you had the senior elders. There were seven of them, hard-smoking old battle axes. Um, <laughs> once upon a time, they had been beautiful concubines, not any longer. Um, and they now ran the palace with a rod of iron. And below them came the senior elders and the elders and the chamberlains, um, also the ochura, the personal attendants, who were the gorgeous girls from whom the shogun could pick his concubines. Then moving down, we have the, com the companion priests, or bozo. Um And these were ladies with shaven heads who dressed as men, as priests. Um, now, I've just, I think this is rather interesting. Um, companion priests were basically the equivalent of eunuchs. Because if you think about the Forbidden City in Peking, yeah, or you think about the Topkapi Harem of the Ottomans, there were tens of thousands of eunuchs. No eunuchs in Japan. Japanese did not go in for castration. Um, so in all those, in those other harems, basically the assumption was that women couldn't run their own affairs. You had to have eunuchs, you had to have men, de-sexed men, to run the harems. But here, the women were powerful. It was a very powerful bureaucracy of women. Um, and there were only four of these obozo, of these companion priests. Here's another picture. Um, and they could go back and forth. They mainly lived in the men's palace. They served the shogun. There's this one down here. Um, but they did not have, they, you know, they, were, they were officials. But basically, there was no massive, massive hierarchy of eunuchs or anything similar. So as I said, the women ran their own affairs. Which, which meant that there was a lot more power for the women. Um, and right at the bottom of the hierarchy, there was um, a rank called Oinu, which meant the honourable dog. Um, and they did errands and they did cleaning and so on. And people treated them like dogs. They shouted, koi, koi, come, come. But they never used these women's name. And even the guards were women. Um, they were a, there was a special corps, they dressed in uniform, and they wielded the halber, the naginata, um, the long-handled spear. Here's a photograph of one. These are men, but it shows you this was the weapon of samurai women. And all samurai women were trained in the naginata so that they would be able to defend the house when the menfolk were away. And the point was, the halber, the naginata, was nine foot long. It was long and it was light. And up here, it had a blade like a samurai sword, which was sharp enough to cut a limb like that. Chum. I've seen these things happening, these things at work, amazing. Um, so <coughs> if a man came running towards you with his sword, you could reach him with your nine foot long nugging out before he got to you. Possibly cut his leg in half, if you were quick, if you were very quick. Um, so the women of the, of the women's palace were particularly adept with the Naginata, they practiced a lot, and my heroine Atsa was rather famous for her skill. 
She was also famously strong, and she was also a formidable horsewoman, so she was quite a woman. Um, the recruitment process varied rank by rank. You had to be you know, a rather high rank if you were going to enter the presence of the shogun. You had to be the daughter of a daimyo. Um, but lower level girls could enter as maids, and then entering the palace was like a finishing school. It was a great way to acquire polish, and then you might get yourself a good husband. Um, and you could rise through the ranks. You could climb right from the bottom, actually, right to the top. So how did the women spend their days? Well, they spent some, quite a lot of time at their toilette. Um, the shogun's consort would wake up at six, and they would, the maids would comb her hair while she's lying on her futon. Then she would wash out her mouth, wash her face with rice bran, um, and she'd have a bath. And then she'd have breakfast, um, and then her maid would get to work to do her makeup. And first of all, they would shave her eyebrows, then they'd freshen up the blackening on her teeth. And at that time, all adult women blackened their teeth. The dye was made by soaking pieces of iron um, in tea or vinegar to give a rust colored liquid, and then adding tannin in the form of sumac gall. So you had these two little jugs of different substances, you mix them together here to make a black lacquer, and then brushed it on with little brushes. And you needed several coats to get a good shiny black um, lacquer on your teeth. And here is the picture I showed you of the court lady with blackened teeth. Um, here's another lady with blackened teeth. There's another lady with blackened teeth. Um, and until 1873, all adult women blacken their teeth. And in 1873, um, the Empress declared, I will no longer blacken my teeth. This was when Japan was wanting to become Western. Um, it was a brand new fashion. And in fact, until about the 1920s, people in remote parts of Japan still blacken their teeth. Not just women, but also the aristocrats <coughs> in the Edo period blacken their teeth. And Erna Sato, by the time the Empress declared she would no longer blacken her teeth, Erna Sato, was a, an English diplomat, and he'd been there 15 years, and he said it looked extremely weird to see women with white teeth all of a sudden. <laughs> then the lady would, the maid would paint the lady's face with white makeup using a lead or mercury-based powder. It was uncouth to have too thin a layer of powder, so it would be applied thickly, and then the hairline, neck, and eyes would also be painted, and um, little bits of rouge at the corner of the eyes and safflower paste on the lips. Here's a cosmetic set um, with combs, scissors, lots of brushes, a mirror stand, and a very lovely box to put it all in. And then the maid would put oil and perfume and comb the lady's hair and coil it into one of many different possible hairstyles. Each hairstyle gave a different message. Um, so this one was for working. If you saw somebody with that sort of hairstyle, you knew she was kind of low-ranking. Um, this also for a low-ranking maid. This one for a higher-ranking maid. Um, and this hairstyle for children and page boys. But all the women were very proud of their long, glossy black hair. Then um, the maid would help the lady into her kimono. Um, there were certain sorts of fabric of kimono which could only be worn by ladies of the women's palace. Um, very expensive fabrics which would be perfumed first, so they'd be left overnight over a brazier with incense in it to scent them. And a robes, their robes were a woman's investment. So the women actually were notorious for their extravagance. Um, there was one uh, new chief counsellor when this shogun, who hadn't liked the ducks, when he died, the new chief councillor decided he wanted to impose stringent economic reforms even on the women's palace. So he said, he called in the chief elder and said, okay, you have to cut back on your spending on kimonos. And she said, you seem to have forgotten that we, most of us here, have to remain virgins throughout our entire life. And that is deprivation enough. So we are blooming well going to continue spending. Um, and in fact, the chief councillor lost his job and the women carried on spending. Um, although they were expensive, the kimonos they wore were kind of 
um, subtle looking, they were restrained. It was more townswomen and courtesans who wore ostentatious kimonos. So this is one with a, a summer kimono with a delicate pattern. Um, this is an over kimono with a quilted hem, and again, kind of quite delicate. They like these pale kimonos. And this is one of my heroine, Princess Atsa's own personal kimonos. And the shogun's consort would change clothes five times a day when she got up, before each audience, and when she went to bed at 9 p.m. So every day, as the clock moved towards 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, and 8 in the evening, the highest ranking women made their way to the upper bell corridor, which led to the double door that divided the men's and the women's palaces, and they took their places in order of rank. The castle drums sounded the hour, and the cluster of bells that hung by the door jangled. And the shaven-headed nuns, the priests, the oborza, unfastened the lock. They drew aside the bolt, and they slid aside the door. And one man stepped through, and that was the shogun. And at these three daily audiences, there were a lot of things to be discussed. One was there would almost certainly be government documents for the shogun to sign. He had to sign every government document. So basically, if you were a government minister and you wanted a certain law passed, you had to butter up the women of the women's palace because he would discuss it, maybe with his mum, maybe with his favourite concubine, maybe with his wet nurse, but he would discuss it with the women. And they might well say to him, now nah, don't sign that. So you had to keep on the right side of the women. Also, there was quite a lot of opportunity for the women to be on two opposing sides. So there was a possibility of deadly rivalry. And they'd also discuss the interesting question of what to do that day, because they had lots and lots of leisure time. So, as I said, Edo Castle was Japan's Versailles. It was a world in itself. There were woods, gardens, streams where they could go boating. Um, they were very cultured. They, they, they did a lot of poetry writing. They wrote waka poetry. They painted. They had com poetry composing gatherings. Some became famous poets or famous artists. And you can also see in what close proximity they lived. Lots living in a single room. Um, they sewed. There's somebody sewing here. Um, and they also read. Um, so they were very, very, they were very cultured people. And they played the incense guessing game, where you have a little piece of incense here, uh, probably cost a fortune on top of um, a little jar of hot ash, giving off a certain scent. And it was like wine tasting. You have to sniff it, and you have to say what it is. What is this incense that you are smelling? And there were lots and lots of beautiful utensils to go with the incense guessing game. Lots of people still play this game. Um, there, were also, there was also the shell matching game, with beautiful boxes to hold the shells. And, um, these tiny little shells either had pictures from the tale of Genji or they had uh, landscapes and you, there were 180 pairs of shells, that's a lot of shells, and you lay them out on the floor, turn one over, turn another one over, if they don't match, turn them down again, then you have to remember which shell was where. It took a lot of time. And they did flower arrangement, they did tea ceremony, they did masks, um, they played musical instruments. They went cherry blossom viewing in the spring. They played games under the cherry trees. There's the shogun out um, cherry blossom viewing, probably with one of his children, and a page boy holding his sword. Um, and they went mushroom hunting. There were certain um, officials in the court whose job it was to make sure there were mushrooms carefully placed among the leaves so that the women could find them. You couldn't have the mushroom hunting without finding any mushrooms. Um, and the shogun would enjoy the annual observances, like New Year, among his women folk. So, the purpose of the palace, the purpose of the palace was to produce an heir. And the quickest way, if you want to climb that ladder, the quickest way to climb that ladder of power was to be the mother of the next shogun. That was the way. Um, and the reason no other men could enter was so that there was no doubt as to whose son it was. Um, and if you bore the shogun's heir, you got a massive rise in salary and you got a massive rise in rank and you got a lot of power. People would give you gifts, hoping that you'd speak to the shogun on their behalf. Basically, 
you, you would run the palace, and that meant you sort of ran the country. So who became a concubine? Um, well, as I said to you, they officially, in theory, there's a lot of in theory and in practice, in theory, they all came from noble families, and the shogun only got to even see women from noble families. But the reality was, quite often he might spot a lovely girl among the maids. They weren't allowed to look at him because they were lowly. That didn't stop him from looking at them. Um, and the 12th shogun in particular was rather famous. He would go out in his palanquin and he would spot, he pushed aside the slats on the window blind of his palanquin, he'd spot a lovely girl on the street, could be anybody. The next thing, she'd be summoned to the castle, given a job, and then she'd be the next concubine. Um, when a poor girl became a concubine, it was said she had stepped into the jeweled palanquin. Um, and as for her father, he was called a firefly lord because he had flitted after the fire in his daughter's tail. And he might, he might go from being a seller of second-hand clothes to being a, a warlord. Goodness gracious. Um, but there was, there was one, um, the mother of the fourth shogun did come from a family that sold second-hand clothes. And her father did become a samurai. But people always actually looked down their noses at him. They said he didn't look, he looked kind of awkward in his clothes. And the mother of the fifth shogun was actually a grocer's daughter. So it just goes to show there was the theory and there was the practice. Um, well, the shoguns got rather maybe fed up with all this bureaucracy. And they, in the early shoguns, took, spent quite a lot of time in the bath. And there, there was one rather cheerful, very low-class girl, kind of Cockney Sparrow sort of girl, to scrub his back. And she officially, she couldn't look at him, but that didn't stop him from looking at her. And um, the result was quite a few children who were known as the children of the bath. Um, anyway, you can imagine the tough old elders put an end to that quite quickly. And thereafter, the poor shogun had to bathe in the men's palace. So as they were kneeling along the upper bell corridor, um, waiting to greet the shogun, the words all the young women were hoping to hear it was, what is her name? And that was the code, what is her name? That was the code meaning, okay, this is my next girl for the night. Um, though in fact it wasn't necessarily up to him. The elders might say to him, you can pick this one, that one, or that one. But so he might have the power of veto, but he couldn't have just anybody. Um, nevertheless, the first shogun, Ieyasa, had 15 concubines. The 11th shogun, Ionari, the one who hadn't liked the Mandarin ducks, he had about 50 concubines. So he was a busy chap. So once you had been picked to sleep with the shogun, first of all, in came the maids with the bedding, lavish, lavish, thick bedding, all embroidered with auspicious designs of long life. And then pillows, not the most comfortable of pillows, but good for keeping your samurai hairstyle in decent shape. You put your neck on that bit. And with the Tokugawa crest, marking it there. And sometimes inside your pillow, there might be a little urn containing incense so that you could smell it and also to make your hair smell nice. And then at the shogun's head, there'd be a box of tissues, a box for his clothes and a sword rest, and a smoking set. And then when everything was set up, along comes the concubine. Um, first of all, the poor girl has to be searched, in fact, quite often strip searched. So they'd take her hair down, they'd make dead sure, nothing sharp in there, no note, no little note saying, uh, perhaps you might just sign this law that my brother was sponsoring, nothing like that. Um, and when they had made sure there was nothing, then they'd put her hair up again, take her back to the chamber, then she'd have to wait, she'd just have to wait, for usually for about an hour. Then the shogun would turn up with the elder and another maid, um, and one of these, these um, companion priests, these women dressed as priests with shaven heads. Um, and he would, he'd chat to the elder, he wouldn't chat to the concubine, she wasn't there for chatting. Um, then the, the, the sleeping arrangements were, you had the shogun's futon in the middle, and then on his right you had the concubine's futon. Uh, she had to sleep facing him. On the other side of the shogun you had a lady in waiting. And she was facing away, but she was not sleeping. She was listening. And then on the other side of the concubine, you had one of the companion priests. So it wasn't that intimate. Um, and then in the next room, behind very, very thin paper doors, 
there was an elder and another maid, also wide awake and listening. So the whole point was to make sure that the concubine didn't start asking any special requests of the shogun. Um, and next morning, the concubine would have to talk about the conversation they'd had, um, and the maid would also report on the conversation she'd overheard in detail, and those accounts had to match, and there would be trouble if they didn't match. So it was not the most exciting of experiences, but it was all worth it if you could get pregnant. And what all concubines hoped was to become the mother of the next shogun. This is a little child jumping on its mum. That would give them huge power. But among the many challenges, one was that at the age of 30, on the stroke of 30, that was it for your sexual relations with the shogun. So if you were going to have children, you had to have children fast before you reached the age of 30. That also applied to the wife. No sex after 30. So the women's palace was a place of staggering luxury and beauty and extravagance. As I said to you, glorious kimonos, lots of leisure, games of shell matching, poetry writing, but there was also intrigue and plotting and jealousy and murder. A lot of boy babies were smothered at birth, um, particularly once the heir to the shogun had been born, his mother obviously didn't want any more boy babies born to be rivals. And she would be powerful enough that there would be somebody prepared to smother that baby. It, obviously, there'd be no connection to her at all, nothing. But that baby would die. And statistically, an extraordinarily high number of shogun's sons died. The 12th shogun, Ieyoshi, had 12 boy children. Only one survived. And there were lots of other deaths too. Women were strangled. Women were poisoned. There was a lot of jealousy over who became the shogun's concubine. People were found dead down wells. People were found dead in palanquins. And powerful women always had tasters for their food. Also, the women preferred there to be a weak shogun so they could tell him what to do. And one poor old shogun was actually poisoned when he was getting a bit too old. And you know, by the, by the time, not the shogun, but the shogun's heir, it was, been, it was felt that by the time he inherited, he would be too old to be manipulable. So that was the end of him. So how did the women exercise power? How did they communicate with their allies outside the palace when they could never leave? There was a saying that the walls have ears and the paper screens have eyes. So to communicate with women inside the palace, your fellow ladies in waiting, this is a smoking set. You put your ash in there, you have your pipes there. You could smooth out the ash. You sit there next to the person you want to communicate with, smooth out the ash, write a few characters on the ash, smooth them over so nobody sees them except the person you want to communicate with. Or you could write a message on a piece of paper and you could burn it straight away. Um, and to communicate with people outside the palace, you could send a letter, you could smuggle out a letter in a purse, you could use an ally like a gardener, as I told you earlier on, who didn't exist. Um, you could also use your chief lady in waiting. Although the shogun's consort, i.e. my heroine, Adsa, she could not leave the palace ever, but it was her lady-in-waiting's job to go out to the temples where the shoguns were buried and to pray to his ancestors for his help. And it was a tradition that when the chief lady-in-waiting did that, she could take her, her maids, her ladies, to the Kabuki theatre in the afternoon for a treat. So you can see there was quite a good chance there to have secret meetings with somebody like Atsa's uncle, for example. Well, a famous example of a concubine who became the mother of the next shogun and thereby achieved great power and also great trouble was somebody called Gekuin. Um, and this happened in 1714. This here, a little bit pixelated, I'm afraid, but that is one of the companion priests, one of the shaven-headed ladies. Um, and basically... The sixth shogun died, the seventh shogun was only four. So we've got a shogun and he's only four. Um, and so his mother, who was a concubine, became very powerful. Um, and he also had a guardian, which was one of the men of the men's palace. He was the lord of Echizen. And everyone was sure that he was the concubine's lover. But if that were ever proven, that would be the end of her. Um, because that was against all the rules. So the villain of the story was the previous shogun's widow. And obviously, she hated Geku in the concubine and wanted to destroy her. Now, Ejima, sorry about the pixel, not, not so bad, not so bad. Ejima, here, there's the 
uh, companion priest, Ejima, was the concubine's chief lady in waiting. And she often went out to the temple to pray at the tomb of the shogun. So the wicked widow, who was out to trap her, arranged for her to meet somebody called Ikushima Shingoro. This is a very famous story in Japan. Um, he was a, an incredibly handsome kabuki actor. Um, so she was out at the theatre with her maids, and she had a, meet a meeting with Ikushima Shingoro. Basically, Ejima was 28. She was a virgin. She'd been living in the palace her whole life, in a convent, in a women's prison, if you like. And here is this man who's like Leonardo DiCaprio, and he's wooing her. So anyway, she went for it. Um, and then she fell for him, and she started secretly seeing him, which was exactly what the widow had planned. So they met again and again. They met at Kabuki. They met in upstairs rooms in restaurants. They met in tea houses. And she got so besotted, she even took a huge risk, and she smuggled him into the castle in a trunk. These were very big trunks, big enough for bedding, certainly big enough for a man. Um, and finally, the wicked widow confronted her and said, OK, you will be let off, but you have to testify that your mistress, the concubine, is having an affair with the Lord of Echizen. Um, but Ejima was loyal, and she refused. So she was sent into exile. And she, went, she left the castle through the Fajormon, um, the unclean gate, which was a small side gate used only for those who left in disgrace. And she walked through barefoot in a single white shift. Her lover, too, went into exile, though there is one version of the story in which he got crucified. And as you possibly know, in Japan, you don't get crucified on a plus sign, you get crucified on an X sign. I thought you'd like to know that. Um, but there was one other person who c comes into this story, and that was Ejima's brother. Because according to the thinking of the time, women were simple, dim creatures who didn't know what they were doing. And it was, your, it was the family's responsibility to bring the girl up so she didn't misbehave. Um, so Ejima's brother, the chief lady in waiting's brother, was probably a long way away in his, in his manor somewhere, minding his own business, and suddenly he would have got a message post haste saying, um, your sister has committed a terrible crime, you must commit seppuku, you must commit harakiri, like now. So it must have been a nasty shock for the poor brother. But that was, so that was the end of the story, that the brother had to kill himself. So as I told you, the shogun's main task was procreation. Um, and both wives and concubines, as I told you, had to retire from their um, <coughs> connubial duties at the age of 30, and lots and lots of children died. So there was a constant need for fresh young concubines to produce new children. This is the 11th shogun, Ienari, the very same one that hadn't liked the Mandarin ducks. Um, he fathered 53 children by 27 concubines. They only list the names of the concubines by whom he had children. There were lots of other concubines who didn't have children, but they were not listed. Um, it was before the Americans arrived, so everybody was kind of relaxed. People were having fun still. Um, I'll tell you about one of his concubines. She was called Lady Omiyo, um, and her father was the head monk of Chisenin Temple. Well, he was a monk, but that hadn't stopped him having four children. Um, and she was incredibly beautiful and extremely bright, and she was spotted, she was taken into the castle, and Ianari spotted her straight away, and she had three daughters. Well, that put her into a position where she could benefit her family. So she arranged that her father's temple should be the place where the palace ladies went to pray for the shogun's health. And they also, of course, made large financial donations. Well, her father, the monk, I said to you, he was not, he was not inhibited about these things. Um, he had affairs with lots of the ladies. And while he was at it, he set up a stable of handsome young monks. And the ladies paid for their services. So this was all lots of fun. And so it went on for 14 years. Then Shogun Ienari died, 18, 1841. And the new chief councillor was that very same one who tried to clamp down on spending in the women's palace. He sent in the temple police. He was obviously a bit of a killjoy. Um, and Lady Omiyo's father, who was 71 by then, was sent into exile. The ladies were just reprimanded. They thought it would be too much of a scandal to make a bigger fuss. 
The next shogun, Ieyoshi, was the 12th shogun, um, he had 11 concubines and 27 children, though most died as infants. Um, he had the bad luck to be shogun when Commodore Perry showed up in those black ships. Um, and he died very suspiciously exactly two weeks after Perry's first visit, exactly two weeks. Um, and he had his, a concubine, his last concubine, his favourite concubine in his later years, was called Lady Cotton. And when he died, she was 23, she was beautiful, she was bright, um, and all the concubines had to shave their heads and go and be nuns. They had to go and live in the Western Palace complex for the rest of their lives. So that was it, that was your life over. You were going to be a nun. Um, so, okay, she did that. Then um, there was some building work needed doing on the Western Palace. And this carpenter turned up, um, very handsome. He looked just like a kabuki actor. Um, and she fell for him. She was only 23. She was beautiful. She was bright. Um, so suddenly she started, she became very devout. She started having to go out to the temple every day to pray, at, to pray at for the shogun's ancestors and to pray for the shogun's soul. And of course, secretly, she was meeting this carpenter. Well, she too had a brother, but his brother, her brother rather, he was a little ahead of the game. Maybe he knew what had happened to Ejima's brother. So he sent a message to the palace saying he was at death's door. He was very ill. Um, so she went back home to see him. And that was the end of her. Nobody knew what became of her. But we can imagine. It was either him or her. Either he was going to have to kill himself or he was going to kill her. So he dealt with her. And his son was Iesada, the 13th shogun. And my heroine, Atsa, she married him. She became his consort. This is from the NHK series, from the TV series, which is a very, very popular series about the life of Princess Atsu. Here they are together. Um, but when she entered the palace, she found herself up against her formidable mother-in-law. <clears throat> Added to which, she was supposed to operate as a kind of undercover agent for her uncle in this palace where the walls had ears and the paper screens had eyes. Well, we're nearly done now, but before we end, I'd like to show you a snippet of video. It's the beginning of the story of the little boy shogun. It's not called video anymore, is it? But anyway, whatever. Um, it's the story of the little boy shogun, and you'll see the wicked widow. You'll see the concubine, who was the shogun's mother. You'll see the handsome guardian, who was her lover. Um, and you'll see the chief lady-in-waiting, who ended up being disgraced. Um, it begins, just a little bit, it begins in the upper bell corridor and keep an eye out for the companion priest. It may be a little jerky. We <laughs> の欲望と人が渦巻く多く。その多くを束ねるべき7代目の将軍が弱い
新たな悲劇の始まりとなったのでございます上様天英院様月光院様におかれまして本日もご期待